Today's topic is building retirement assessment and retirement and estate assessment reports. And just to remind you, everything that we'll cover today is, of course, available through the training videos. So if we go to VisionWorks in the financial planning videos, what you'll see in the lower right corner is uh, the report text templates video and the preparing a report video. You'll also notice the to-do list, which I'll leave uh, for you to look at separately. But today we're going to focus on uh, report templates and text templates. So we're with the same file that we created last week, our little uh, Bill and Sue sample file. You may recall that we did import uh, Joan and I. And also you'll recall that in this particular case, um, there was a substantial income assets shortfall to begin. And then what we did was uh, downsize the house, uh, reallocate portfolios, applied some tax tactics, and so on. So if we go to reports, uh, what you should be familiar with is that all reports are broken into sections and subsections. So we can see this on the report tab. We have uh, different sections and different subsections. So as an example, if I go to overview uh, and select that section, you can see the different subsections that are available for it. Or if I go down to um, reducing income taxes, for instance, you can see the different subsections that are available. So what you're able to do is create section templates. Uh, and just to give you an example, I've got one that I call doctors. And what it does is it selects certain sections and subsections that I think would be appropriate for a uh, report for doctors. So you're able to, uh, if you will, profile a client and say, uh, I want to keep things very high level, very graphical, very simple for a certain audience. Uh, in our case, I'm using doctors as an example. And I want you to notice when I look at the appendix that I haven't selected any of these highly detailed tables, year by year, annual net cash flow, year by year, value of income assets, and so on. What I am able to do, though, is for a different profile of client, let's say a, a business person, an engineer, somebody who may like numbers, I can select different sections and subsections. And then when I'm doing a report, let's say for a business person, I can open my business person template. And in this case, whereas I may have exactly the same content as I do for doctors, what I've also done is added the appendix and included the net cash flow and income asset year by year uh, content. So literally, it's just a matter of going through, selecting uh, the sections and subsections that you want to include in the report. And once you've selected them, just saving them as a template and then having it available for future use for, you know, that profile, if you will, of clients. So I'm going to uh, load one in uh, for retirement and estate assessment. And you can see uh, different things that I've uh, selected here. And it's really just a matter of going through and perhaps loading up everything and then, you know, uh, clicking print preview, which will then build the plan in scanning through things and deciding what you'd like to keep in uh, your reports. The other thing that you can do is you can create text templates. So in a retirement and estate assessment plan, you can see that there are some uh, defaults that we already use. But what you're able to do is go to report options, uh, select uh, any template you want, default uh, retirement and estate assessment, and notice there's a pre and post version. But I could select a retirement and estate assessment, click the copy button, 
uh, give it a name, whatever I wanted to call it, and then uh, what I'm able to do is edit the text in the report and save any editing changes to the uh, text template. So uh, you can see here that we've got the uh, pre-retirement template selected. So what this does is it gives you the ability to uh, change the default text uh, that we supply to whatever you want, um, but also in the case of a retirement assessment plan, you have the ability to uh, load text that is appropriate for somebody who's still working, so something like uh, income assets um, uh, and talking in terms of accumulating income assets to eventually be used in retirement, whereas if you're dealing with somebody who's already retired, you might want to change the text in the income assets section to talk in terms of uh, consuming the previously um, accumulated income producing assets. So the whole concept then is uh, we want to be able to go in, select the section template so it has just the content we want, not too much, not too little, and then select the text template that's appropriate for that kind of client. Now, you will notice with retirement and estate assessment plans uh, and plain retirement uh, assessment plans that the text template can be edited, but it's also pre-selected here. And the reason for that is that when we create a retirement uh, plan, we know what type it is, and we know whether people are still working or not working or whatever. So that gives, uh, that gives us the ability to load the appropriate type of text. So I'm just gonna open this up, and we can see uh, what's done. Now, one of the observations I'll make that we had last week gone in and done some tax optimization. Having done that, you might then turn around and uh, change some entry, perhaps reallocate a portfolio, add a vacation expense during retirement, whatever it might be. And you might have done that after you did the tax uh, optimization. So when the report is being built, what the software actually does is it goes back in and um, it does another tax calculation as a double check to make sure that uh, any of the tax optimization is absolutely up to date. If you did the tax optimization, subsequently made some change, then that could affect, of course, the, the optimization calculations. So, what the software does is it, when it assembles the report, it repeats the optimization calculations just to make sure that, um, that there are no changes. So that's the reason why assembling a report uh, you know, can take uh, 30 seconds or so. And again, the length of time it takes to assemble a report is going to be based on uh, you know, what's been included. And then once we uh, go through this, we'll talk about, um, you know, what section should we include in the report. So let's have a look at what we've got here. Again, the look and feel, images, logos, colors, fonts, point size, all of those sorts of things are, of course, controlled by uh, Presentation Builder, so all the branding look and feel. You can see that this report's fairly long. So I've included an introduction page. I just talked about uh, the financial gap. Are you accumulating enough wealth to have and do what you want? The estate gap and the emergency and protection planning gaps. And again, I'll remind you that if the image is used, that um, you can control the colors for it also in Presentation Builder. So this is just plan parties. Who are the parties in the plan? Family tree. Um, the overview section shows current net worth. These people don't have any liabilities. And then what it also does is it shows the projected net worth at retirement. And you'll notice from the uh, uh, legend here that the initial vision is light blue and the plan after we've made the changes is the darker blue. So we can see 
a slight improvement in the net worth at retirement. But the key really is that we've got a huge improvement in the total sources and total uses. So before, you may recall there was a big gap, and now uh, we've you know resolved any issue that um, that they had. So part of that, of course, was uh, converting the house to um, a condo. Uh, general assumptions, and then if you wish, you know, protection planning uh, assumptions, and we haven't uh, so far calculated any of this. Um, To-do lists are available, which will just include, you know, the projected savings over the next few years, uh, contributions to TFSAs, etc. The ability to compare uh, the path the clients were on to begin, which showed a huge shortfall, with the new path after we've made the changes. So this is all fairly straightforward. Notice with goals, this is a table. So it's just a summary of their uh, different expenses and so on. And then if there are wants that are out in time, let's say come retirement, special vacations every few years or whatever, you can then click here, edit the text and itemize those particular wants. So you'll notice as we go through that there are places where there are there is text. You can click on any text you see, and then you can go in and edit it however you wish. Um, I don't want to do too much editing, but I'll just put something in. And notice now I can either save that edit edit to the current text template, so we can change the basic template that's always going to uh, come up or I can save a change just for the existing file. So uh, I will uh, caution you that when you make changes, it will take a while be- to, uh, to save those changes because it's going through and you know, virtually saving the text template. So uh, you can go through anything that's sort of standard default text, go ahead, you know, make whatever changes you want to make. And then uh, other things that speak specifically to different tactics for a client, you can go in and and edit the text uh, to personalize it for that client. You know, something about, you you know, you plan to downsize your house in 2030 or whatever it might be. Um, I would uh, suggest to you that uh, when you go through and make changes that uh, personalize things, that you do it more towards the beginning of the plan. Uh, In other words, you don't want the uh, clients to think in terms of a cookie cutter plan. You want them to see their name or whatever, or something specific that they're going to do, um, which just gives them a sense that uh, everything you've done is all, uh, you know, being done for for their benefit and and nothing that's sort of, um, you know, default type reports. Um, but I think most of that can be done early in the plan. And then later, I think the default text that you set up will probably suffice. So again, coming back to the concept of the three C's, we talk about converting, creating, conserving wealth, and then of course, a special form of conserve, which is reduced taxes. So you may or may not like this style. It's going to be up to you. Uh, but if we start first with what kinds of things can we do to uh, save on income taxes, then any of the tax tactics that were applied uh, would be showing in this plan. In this case, uh, as it turns out, nothing applies. This would be subsequent to the downsize of the house. Notice the next section is then convert, and we can see that we talked in terms of downsizing the house in 2030, uh, the sale proceeds for the house, the purchase cost of the condo, the capital that's taken out, and how that capital bumps up the income-producing assets and helps them last. So that's then very specific to this client, and this would be a very good case where you could go in, edit the text, and speak in terms of them you know, downsizing their house in 2030. Uh, and that would be something that would be you know, then really personalizing the plan. 
Uh, creating wealth, in this case, we're just going to look at portfolio reallocations. They want you to notice that this is total. So this is all of Bill's portfolios and the weighted return that is, has been applied to all of them and also the geography applied to all portfolios. And the same thing for, for Sue, it's total. So this uh, total value includes open portfolios, TFSAs, RSPs. And I'll come back and speak about this in a, in a minute. And then, of course, there's conserve, which could include anything that had to do with, you know, any changes in expenses and so on. Uh, and then other sections that you can choose or not choose. So we're repeating that retirement funding gap. Um, just uh, what are the different uh, 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 sources of funds during retirement, total of uses. Uh, again, you know, you'll have to go through, decide what you want. OAS, CPP, pension income, portfolio income, any other income that uh, might be included. You can see here that would include, for in instance, uh, the downsizing of the house and, and what, and, uh, and then the purchase of the condo, the surplus and what that does to the income producing assets to help them last. Um, so again, I don't want to go through this in great detail. This is going to be up to you to have a look at it and decide what you want to include or not include. Um, you'll notice, by the way, that this is a retirement and estate assessment plan. So as a result, we've got all of the uh, beneficiary output and, uh, and so on included in it. And then uh, also we've included uh, some of the protection planning uh, gap calculations. So if we have a look, just a few things that I want to point out. With reducing income taxes, you can leave everything selected. And again, what the software will do is it will go through, it will do a calculation, and it will include only those things that apply. And as we discovered, because of the sale of the house, uh, actually none of these things apply. So if you've created your template and in a particular client's case, downsizing the house doesn't apply, then what you're able to do is simply deselect that section and not include it in the plan. And you'll notice that the section template now says custom, but I could now go in if I wished and I could save this as the Smith template uh, because it, it um, it uh, isn't my generic template for doctors or business people. I've actually changed some of the, uh, the uh, uh, content. The other thing that I wanted to point out was uh, the investment policy state or investment policy section. So you'll notice, again, as we saw, that what I've done is I've included all portfolios. And the reason for this is so that the plan has balance and it's not just portfolio heavy. So getting from where somebody is to where they want to be, the three C's can include reducing taxes, downsizing a house, reallocating a portfolio, could have something to do with their career path. That's a create option, especially for the people who are self-employed. And again, you know, when I talk to financial advisors, I observe that for you to have the life you want, you're trying to build your business, and we have a lot of clients who are in the same position. So, uh, you know, uh, portfolio reallocations are only part of the plan, and we don't want the plan to be overweighted. There are other factors that can be equally as impactful as uh, portfolio returns. So my suggestion is that the plan include uh, just the total of all portfolios. And then what you're able to do is you're able to clear everything out, select, let's say, the cover page, select the uh, investment policy statement and the each portfolio um, checkboxes and create a separate uh, report that can be your IPS report. So you can see I've already done that. So now I can do the plan. The different uh, uh, C's are in balance in the plan. 
but I can create a separate document, which is the IPS, and now you can see that it's just the IPS with all the portfolios included in it. Uh, so now I can have several pages that focus on portfolios, but I'm not overweighting the plan proper. So it's kind of a, an appendix, if you will, or a supplementary plan. So what we want to do uh, after we look at this is we'll go back, we'll again talk about the three C's, and we'll talk about what should we include in a plan. And again, it will depend entirely on the client. So here we are uh, with uh, now all portfolios. So you can see Bill's non-registered portfolio, current, proposed, um, his um, uh, TFSA, his RRSP, and then the total, which you could include or not include, and then also the same thing with Sue, value of her non-reg, her TFSA, her RSP, and so on. So this can then be a number of pages long. Everything is itemized, but we haven't overdone portfolios in the plan proper. So let's uh, go back and bring up our uh, three C's and five main plan themes uh, PDF file. And just to run through it again, very briefly, all plans will exhibit one of five themes, house rich, cash poor, which is where we started last week with the Bill and Sue file. Uh, large latte factor. This really doesn't apply so much in the case of a retirement uh, plan, simply because pre-retirement, we're really just interested in what are you saving, by which I mean savings in non-registered portfolios, contributions to TFSAs, contributions to RSPs. There are only two things you can do with money. You can keep it, save it, contribute it, or you can spend it. So in a retirement plan, up to retirement, we're really mainly interested in what is it that's sticking, what are you saving, and then we're assuming everything else is being spent. So uh, we're not looking in the pre-retirement years at um, some uh, misleading savings capability. This is a theme that's more appropriate in a financial plan. But if we scroll down the net cash flow theme, could be much the same, although this could apply to somebody during retirement. Uh, okay to spend more, uh, which is um, very uh, commonplace for retired people. And then, of course, the high net worth theme for people who are in the mass affluent uh, or high net, higher net worth category, uh, answering the question, will, be, will I be okay in retirement, may be comforting for them, but it really, I don't think, is nearly all that insightful. The problem for people in that situation is uh, likely an estate issue. We want to keep the cottage in the family, and they have no idea what the uh, capital gains taxes will be. So uh, I think uncovering their estate gap is much more appropriate for um, the mass affluent to higher net worth client or more meaningful. So um, we know what the uh, three C's are. Uh, reduce income taxes, convert wealth, create wealth, and conserve wealth. And so what we really want to do when we create a plan is to say, okay, what kind of sections and subsections generally do I want to include? So again, I'll go back and I'll open my doctor's template. And then what I'm able to do is go through and say, okay, so what was it? What was the theme for these clients? And what was it that we did? So uh, in this case, we want to make sure that we include something about converting wealth because we downsized the house. We reallocated portfolios, so we want to include something about that. Um, uh, and then any of the other things that were relevant. Uh, again, we can uh, use reducing income taxes if um, no tax tactics apply. None of these help. Uh, and then finally, we can talk about conserving wealth if there's something that some change we made, uh, you know, in, in the actual spending plan. 
So those are the things that I wanted to cover today. And uh, what I'll do now is I'll just throw things open for questions. The conference is now in talk mode. Everyone can talk now. So, anybody with any questions? Um, I, I would, I, I my, would my, like. Sorry? So, uh, it's John, Michael. Oh, John, yeah. uh, Just wondering if, it, is this, would it be appropriate to show um, how you would handle the question of drawing down your riff before the age of 71 because it might be more efficient tax-wise? Sure, it's one of the things we actually covered last week, but let's go to solutions. Uh, I think it's a really good question and really worth uh, reviewing, and, I, and I, I think you'll find this very interesting. I'm actually going to go to the estate tab first of all. Um, so I have Bill and Sue, uh, Sue being you know Bill's beneficiary for uh, the rollover of, of Bill's half of the house, the remaining assets in his uh, RIF and TFSA out at his life expectancy. And we can see minor negative liquid assets for him um, and, and really not much uh, else. So, you know, this is in pretty good shape. But if we look at Sue, um, what's happening is, in this case, it's actually okay. We've got all these uh, assets going to and uh, and but we've got big terminal taxes because of the cottage uh, that's going to the children so the the taxable capital gain on it this is still a, a you know in fairly good shape but what we can do is we can go in and if we look at withdrawals what you see here is that the default is to withdraw from the non-registered portfolio first, then the TFSA, and then the RRSP. And when it comes to uh, uh, ages, the begin age is the age when uh, the RSP is ripped. And this is actually quite early. It's, it's uh, you can see for Bill, for instance, it's 65. So this is just defaulting to them riffing when they retire. That's just the default for retirement and the state assessment plan. The from age is when we turn on what we call auto withdrawals, where the amount of money that's taken out has to be the minimum, uh, but then uh, you can take out more than the minimum uh, in order to uh, meet your cash needs in a year, your spending in a year. So auto withdrawals automatically does that. Now the reason for the begin age of 65 and the from age of 72, if we go to Bill's uh, uh, RRSP and look at RIF, we can actually, from 65 to 72, we can actually uh, control the withdrawals. So we, the idea is that uh, the from age starts uh, the RIF withdrawals. The um, uh, sorry, the begin age starts the RIF, RIF withdrawals, and the from age is when auto withdrawals automatically uh, take over. So what you can do is you can have, for instance, the from age and the uh, because being the same. But what I want to show you, because quite important, is we can move. So in this case, we're going to withdraw money entirely from the non-reg to meet our needs. When it's all used up, we'll then go to the TFSA to meet our needs. When it's used up, we'll go to the RRSP. But what we can do is we can move the RIF to the number one position move the uh, TFSA to the number two position, and then we have the ability to go in and say, uh, let's optimize for taxes. So I can go in and uh, select tax bracket, let's say the first bracket, and, and instruct the software um, to withdraw 
first from the RIF, but only up to the first tax bracket, which I think now is around $46,000. So if I have a need, let's say, of $60,000, what I can do is I can withdraw from the RIF up to uh, of the 46000 the first tax bracket, and then for the additional 14000 that I need, you know, the 60000 in total, I can then take that money out of the TFSA. So what this is doing is it's giving me my 60000 that I need, but it's giving me a combination of, from the, the, the RIF and the TFSA so that I keep my taxable income as low as possible. Does that answer your question, John? Yeah, and that would be the optimal tax? That, that would be. Now, here's the thing. Now, you'll notice that this shows lower um, income assets as a consequence, and that's only because uh, we turn, what we might have done is we might have moved the RSP into the number one position, the TFSA into the number two position, applied that before we did this tax optimization. So the, the point that I, I want to make, and I think it's very interesting, it's why I started with the estate comment. The, what might be best for estate purposes is that we melt the registered assets first keeping the non-registered money as long as possible. It's the non-registered money, the liquid assets, open portfolios, uh, bank accounts, and so on. It's the non-registered money that is available to pay our terminal charges, state administration taxes, and so on, uh, you know, income taxes, and so on. So what happens is, um, we might have less net worth because we're not keeping our money in our registered plans as long as possible, where, it's, where growth is compounding tax-free uh, if we take money from our, our open portfolio first. So we take money from our open portfolio, we keep our RSP money as long as possible, 72, it's compounding tax-free. That can be have the, the best look for uh, income, yes. the total value of income assets. Then as soon as we switch to let's keep the, uh, let's melt the RSP first, we're not compounding money as long as we could, but what we're doing is we're saving the non-registered portfolio money until the end because our, one of our core issues is actually not wealth. One of our core issues is actually liquidity for estate purposes, you know, keeping a cottage in the family, for instance. So some of the files that I use to demonstrate this, there can be a severe estate issue, and then by uh, melting the RSP first, um, I can, to a very great degree, actually correct a lot of that estate issue. Is that clear? Yeah, that's good. Okay. Let me just let me just say it a different way. In normal financial planning, when we look at uh, tax optimization or maximizing wealth or whatever, um, you know, it's often oh well, we'll we'll uh, use the non-registered money first. The problem is that it's the non-registered money which provides the liquidity for estate issues, and so it's really a question of how severe are those estate issues, uh, how important are they to the client, and should we think about um, melting, uh, you know, registered money first and keeping the non-registered money last, and if we are melting the registered money first, then the tax bracket optimization can help us to at least you know, keep the, the, the withdrawals from the registered account uh, uh, from a tax point of view, you know, as low as possible, first tax bracket before we, and then we can tap into other non-taxable sources. Other, other questions?
So just going back to keeping in, in um, you know, with our theme for today, which is uh, building RA and REA report, um, depending on what the theme is, that will help us understand which of the th uh, three C's to apply. I would think very much every plan, we should at least see if there are ways to, to uh, you know, reduce income taxes. Um, so that will, uh, you know, direct us as to, you know, what sorts of tactics to look at people. And then once we've looked at the different tactics and built the plan, as we did, which was we adjusted some vehicle expenses to be a little more realistic about those. We reallocated portfolios. We did some tax optimization and we downsized the house. Then uh, when it comes to what you want in the report, it's going to be up to you to go through the different report sections, decide, you know, what you want to include. There's a lot to choose from. And then having decided what you want to include, um, you can create templates and then you can use those templates. Uh, uh, you can then go in and modify them depending on what tactic was or what tactics were applied, like if we didn't downsize the house, we wouldn't include converting wealth. But again, you'll see that the text template now says custom. So I could save that as the Smith's uh, template if I wished. Um, and then the ability to change the text so that I can alter the default text uh, to whatever I want. But then I can also go in and I, uh, uh, personalize text so I speak specifically to the client and again I think that's the sort of thing if you do it just early in the report uh, that will suffice but I can alter some of the text uh, to make it look like everything I've done is written you know very specifically for that client. Michael in the report I know that you can uh, modify to put in like we can put in our own logo and things like that but in the body of the report, uh, for example, where you had the sort of circular planning cycle, yeah. is there an ability for us to drop our own sort of JPG files or things like that in the in the program? Uh, not in some of those sections, like the the the, uh, the introduction section, for instance. But what you can do is you can add your own section. So I can go in and say introduction me <laughs> and then and then what I could do is I could go to the introduction me I wouldn't include the introduction section I could go to the introduction me and I could put in whatever text I wanted to put in and also add a logo all right sorry a graphic in the body of the report could you put in uh, images yes but you have you have to you, yes yes copy all the text out of the introduction, drop it into the introduction me, save it as introduction me with our own alternate logos and alternate or, or graphics, uh, yeah. And things like yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's, there, there's, and I'm answering the question in the simplest possible way, but one of the things that, uh, oh, sorry, I guess we closed out of that, that you'll have to look at when, um, when you go through the videos. Uh, is that um, uh, you, you may have to create something in Word, save it as what's called an RTF file. So Word has its own formatting code attached to everything. But when you save it as an RTF file, which means rich text format, um, it's kind of generic. So you may have to compose something, do it in Word, put in a graphic, whatever, save it as an RTF file, select it, and then paste that in. The, okay. the video will explain how. It's just a, kind of like something that's more universal. Um, so there was another question, but I couldn't have, it was longer and I couldn't see it all. So let me just see if I can find it here. Uh, so I could, uh, the reporter's generating a solution output with initial information showing only when there is a comparison. Um, 
Sorry, let me just read this question. When we select baseline plan as initial and selected plan as the solution, we're referring to the baseline plan and the selected plan down here. The report is generated using solution output with initial information show, showing only when there is a comparison. That would be correct. So if, if I were to go back to the initial vision, then uh, both baseline and selected plan would be initial vision. There wouldn't be any comparison. I, I, um, uh, we haven't ex done some things here that would be more relevant, but the, the concept is that I can go in and start a plan in 2018, call it the initial vision, whatever I want to call it, uh, uh, and in, or call it, you know, uh, plan 2018. Next year, uh, we go in and we make some sort of revisions, whatever it is, so we can compare plan 2018 with plan 2019. Problem is five years from now, I don't want to be comparing, you know, plan 2023 with plan 2018. I could select the baseline as being 2022, compare it with 2023. So I'm always comparing, say, with the year before. So that's one of the things. But uh, in our little example here, uh, the example that I like to use, actually, and I'll just close this out and see if I can bring this up. Um, I'm going to open a, a file that's uh, got the five themes in it. And I'm going to uh, actually switch from the house rich cash poor theme to the uh, high latte factor theme, or large latte factor theme. And this is one of my favorite examples. So what happens is we have people very often who have no idea really what they're spending. So if we look at the net cash, what we see here is that uh, combined, it's showing annual net cash flow uh, of, you know, $70,000 a year. And most people can identify their sources. It would be their career income. You can see this is the total for Bill and Sue. But when we ask them about their spending, their uses, this is where they fall short. So because sources minus uses is in theory what you should be able to save, what we end up with then is this extraordinarily high savings rate. And then, of course, the key is if we say to people, well, you know, uh, how much have you got in your non-registered portfolio, and they say very little or none, then we know we're, they're not saving this. In fact, they're spending it. This is the large latte factor. So what happens is the net cash looks really good, and what we're doing is we're getting, as a consequence, a big buildup in the income-producing assets. So... One of the things that, you know, we all have a latte factor, so we all have to acknowledge that. It's really only a question of how big it is. But one of the things that we have to do with some people is help them get their uh, spending under control. Because if it isn't under control, then they can't manage today, then they'll never have the future that they want. They won't be able to manage the future. So in our little example, what I'm just going to do is go into lifestyle. I have a restaurant's entry. And I grant you it's not very much. It's only 7500 But uh, if you've got a client who's got a very large, um, you know, uh, entertainment bill, whatever it might be, and you make some adjustments. So notice I'm just going to adjust it from 75 down to um, 1000 What ends up happening, of course, is that we're going to um, save that money, and that money that we save is going to be invested. Now, if I go to reports... Um, what I'm, oh, sorry, I, I apologize for this. I've done something, I, sorry, I should have done something else. Let me go back and, and fix this. Uh, what I should have done before I made the change was create a new solution. So keep in mind, whatever you're doing, um, uh, when you want to, you know, do a before and after, you should always create a new solution. So let me go back and, and uh, redo this. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll, put in a, that larger um, that larger spending. So 
Uh, we'll go back to entertainment, restaurants. We'll make this $20,000 or something. Let's just do this quickly. And then what we'll do is we'll create a new solution uh, based on this. And I'm going to call this, uh, you know, reduce spending or whatever I want to call it. And now I'll make the change in it so I can do the comparison. So we'll make this $10,000, half as much. Automatically, of course, if we're not spending the money, we're saving it. And if we're saving it, it's being invested. But the point that I, I want to uh, get to here is if we look at this, the three C's, convert, create, conserve, and if you're dealing with somebody who's got a lot of spending uh, that's out of control, and we need to you know, start capturing that, uh, putting the money away, uh, in order to accumulate sufficient income producing assets. Uh, one of the, I think, most powerful um, uh, pieces or sections of the report, and I'm just going to clear everything, I'll select the cover page, and I'm going to select conserving wealth. I'm going to clear all this off, and I'm just going to select the current and proposed spending plan. And now what I'm going to be able to do is I'm going to be able to compare house rich, the path you're on, with the reduced spending. So our drop in restaurant expenses from 20000 to 10000 And you'll see then in the report that it shows what the different expenses are and specifically where we're going to go and make a change. Uh, so saying to somebody, you know, save an extra X number of dollars, I don't care where you're going to get the money from, I'm not sure is all that effective because I don't know if people can necessarily, you know, focus in on, you know, what am I spending where and what kind of change that I, do I need to make. Now I'm speaking of people for whom, you know, there's a, a, a definite issue. So you can see, I guess there's some other things that were done, but you can see here, um, that we've changed the restaurant expenses. Oh, we've got 12. I thought we had 20, uh, well, whatever. Uh, the change in the, we must have changed something else somewhere. Um, or we have, maybe we have excess cash turned on. But it'll highlight wherever changes are being made. Oh, I picked the, Jeremy said I picked the wrong compare. Sorry, house rich. Oh, it's house rich cash poor. I apologize. Large latte factor and reduced spending. Here we go. So it's the large latte factor and the reduced spending that we're comparing, not, of course, house rich cash poor. So this will make more sense now. So there we go. So now we can see very specifically, here are your different expenses. We need to uh, capture more. So, you know, where, what are we going to look at? Well, we're going to look at uh, restaurant spending and we're going to reduce our restaurant spending from 20,000 to 10,000. And then that's going to allow us to save more money. So this is very focused. And I think it's really what helps people who are in this position where their spending's out of control. I think for those people, we really do need to help them focus on specific areas rather than just making it very general. So I, I believe that this for, for the right the right client can be quite powerful. And again, it's just part of the whole conserve. Other uh, questions? Okay, well, anybody? Sorry? No? So next week we're going to do converting retirement into state assessment plans to financial plans and what the difference is. So the idea, uh, what are the other five categories? 
Um, by categories, do you mean themes? If you mean themes, they are house rich, cash poor, large latte factor, net cash, okay to spend more, and high net worth. They're in the, the three C's and five main plan themes uh, PDF file, which is what we were looking at here. So again, you know, these aren't, the themes aren't built in to the software. It's a matter of looking at the output and saying, what are the themes? Net worth looks okay, income assets show a shortfall. The net worth is being built in the house and the cottage. We're not saving enough, uh, building enough income producing assets to be able to uh, take care of our projected expenses during our retirement years. So house rich, cash poor. Um, and then what we were just looking at was the large latte theme. You know, we know what our sources are, but we're woefully underestimating our uses and therefore the software is calculating large savings causing us to show a large buildup in income producing assets. But when we ask people, what are you really saving? Uh, we find they're not saving much at all other than their TFSA and, and RSP contributions. So um, if we were to eliminate this, what would happen is, um, you know, the picture would change drastically. As a matter of fact, in most cases, it ends up looking like this. So next week we'll we'll move on and we'll talk about you know going to the next level, which is doing a, a financial plans. So thanks again for your time today. Um, we should be posting another video if it turns out okay, and uh, we'll let you know when it's up on our YouTube channel. Thanks. <laughs>